Um, uh, so I think that we are live, um, and I'm hoping that our technology is working. Um, I'm uh, going to keep an eye on the comments if anybody are ha is having uh, uh, any trouble. Uh, but my name is John Harris, and I am uh, uh, the founding editor uh, of Politico here in Washington, D.C. This is I've been connected with uh, Harassus events uh, on a handful of occasions in the past. Delighted to be again. Uh, we've got um, uh, an important topic, as those of you who have seen the uh, uh, the, the, the description in the program uh, uh, have noticed it's the future of American elections. Uh, I, I think just by a, a year or two, I'm older than any of the, uh, well, by several years over some of our panels, but I think I'm older than the old, the second oldest by a couple of years. Uh, and I have to say uh, 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 that I certainly grew up uh, thinking that this was never a question uh, uh, you know, there are lots of things to worry about, but we didn't have to worry about the uh, uh, integrity of our elections. And we didn't have to worry about the basic American tradition that people honored the results of elections or that uh, the public, uh, whether they were happy with the results or unhappy with the results, uh, could have a high degree of, uh, of confidence and would accept the outcome. Uh, that is something that grew up accepting, but plainly not the prevailing assumption right now where there are... Um, uh, 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 great concerns on multiple fronts uh, about the uh, uh, reliability and integrity uh, of, uh, and some would say the legitimacy uh, of American elections. And uh, one of the questions I'd like to explore today is uh, uh, how much uh, this crisis is indeed a profound crisis and how much is uh, just a, a question that we, we've gone through a polarized period and we've still got some bones uh, stuck in our throat from different elections and uh, um, you know, that th th this too shall pass. Uh, do we have fundamental structural problems? Uh, and if so, what is the character of, of those problems? Um, uh, we, we're going to be joined uh, in a minute by Congressman Brendan Boyle uh, 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 of Pennsylvania, who let us know he's going to be coming just a little bit uh, late. Uh, so that's not a surprise. Uh, the two people with me now are more than capable of, of carrying us until then. Uh, Congressman Jim Himes of Connecticut, uh, is joining us. And uh, Nevada State Treasurer uh, Zach Conine is, is joining us uh, from, uh, are you from, where are you today? Are you in? Uh, I'm in Las Vegas, which I encourage Vegas. everyone to visit. Okay. Uh, and uh, I'm really hoping that we can get a robust conversation going in our, in our short time. So those of you in the room, please use the comments and uh, ask questions and we will, uh, uh, we'll take the conversation spontaneously, but I'll pass this on to both of you. Um, certainly with an audience that's, uh, uh, that, that's viewing this, uh, uh, many people in the audience from overseas, what would you tell them? Uh, uh, how, how seriously is they read about, you know, the United States, the world's oldest democracy, having uh, uh, controversies about its elections? Is this for real or, or is this something that they can exhale about? Uh, uh, Congressman, why don't we start with you? Yeah, yeah. Well, no, thank you. Thank you for the uh, the, the really interesting question and for inviting me on. Um, look, this is real. This is very real. I was in the chamber on January 6th when a violent attempt was made to uh, interfere with the constitutional process of selecting the president. So you, you can't have watched January 6th and say um, that this isn't real. Um, and it's real um, because there are plenty of folks, um, you know, various polls would suggest that it's somewhere 60, 70 percent of the uh, registered Republicans in the country who continue to believe that Joe Biden is, is not a, a legitimately elected president. So I think I, I think what's really important here, though, is you need to sort of pull apart at least three areas to think about. Um, and, and, and one of those areas we have a lot to say on, uh, one of those we don't. And so, so let me really quickly outline what I think are those three areas. Um, you've got the sort of information environment where Americans, you know, hear about candidates and watch debates and get the advertisements and everything. Um, you know, under the First Amendment, the government doesn't have a lot to say about that. And let's set that aside for a second. Um, then you have a category of things, which is uh, how easy or how hard should it be for Americans to vote? And there's a long historical record here. Um, you know, going back hundreds of years where certain groups, usually African-Americans, been disadvantaged by things like poll taxes. And it wasn't, in fact, until 1965 with the passage of the Voting Rights Act that we could sort of say, OK, we have a basic baseline of 
of you know franchise for everyone. Now we have these arguments about how much early voting, uh, you know, mail-in voting. Those are all good arguments, right? And 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 ones that we should have. And, the third area, though, that is most concerning to me, where we have a lot to do about it, is that we've got a lot of ambiguity in the system about exactly how you elect a president. So, um, and I'm not going to get into the weeds on this because there's a lot to cover, but, um, you know, Article 1, Section 4 splits authority for elections between the states and the state legislatures, of course, are, are initially mentioned as determining the manner and place and time of elections. Uh, and then the, sometimes my friends forget to include the second part, which says that, but Congress can legislate and regulate their, uh, therein. So it's split authority. And here's where I think you've got a real problem, because we see efforts um, in places like Georgia, largely in red states, we see efforts to take the mechanics of that process of certifying electors uh, and take it out of the hands of people like Brad Raffensperger, who was the secretary of state in Georgia, who memorably refused the president's then president's request to find 11,000 votes and to slide that authority into state legislatures, which are very partisan beings. And so one of the things I think we must do is clarify that mechanic. Um, by the way, we should clarify exactly what it means for the Congress to certify the electoral ballots that are sent to the to Washington. We should be very clear about whether the president, the vice president, sorry, has the authority to do anything other than administer that process. There's a lot of lack of clarity there. And just to close out why I think this is really important, you know, let's imagine 2024, um, the state of Arizona, just to pick on Arizona, decides that they don't really like the outcome of the popular vote count, and therefore they're going to certify a slate of electors and send to Washington a slate of electors that flip the election. Let's just say, for hypothetical sake, to Donald Trump. Now we have a very serious constitutional crisis that could result in violence, that could result in a really clear, un, uh, uh, unclear outcome. And that area of the mechanics, that's something that I think we had better fix up or we're going to find ourselves at real risk of a constitutional crisis. Yeah. Thank you, Congressman. And I noticed Congressman uh, Brendan Boyle has joined us uh, we'll, uh, he, uh, just a little bit late as he had signaled that he might be. We're glad you could make it. Thank you, Congressman. I, I'll give you a moment to collect yourself and I'll go to uh, Nevada uh, Treasurer Zach Conine. Uh, um, uh, I heard in, in uh, the congressman's remarks, the, the, there's uh, almost two categories. There's the, uh, the, the the technical category, which would include our uh, questions about law and procedures. So we didn't think they were murky, uh, but it turns out uh, under the pressure of events, there, there is uh, ambiguity that we didn't uh, expect. And I'd say also in the technical realm, uh, technical not meaning to dismiss it, it could be critically important, but would be questions of uh, hacking. Uh, or, or just basic the security and the integrity of the process of vote counting. If you put those in one set, uh, and, and then you maybe put in the other set, really questions that aren't technical, but they're, they're political, that like people uh, aren't willing to respect the results, or they aren't willing to trust the results, uh, or they're willing to defy, um, uh, defy precedent to get results they don't, uh, 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 different than the one uh, that, that the election authorities certified. So I guess take this where you wish, but I am curious if you would address, do you see that this being primarily a problem of, uh, of procedures? We've got to improve our procedures or something more fundamental really in the soul of our democracy that, that, that we, we don't really have, a lot of people don't have confidence in it anymore. Well, I, I think to some extent, and again, thanks for having me here. And it's an interesting topic um, for a treasurer to talk about because we're mostly concerned with economic and investment stability. But this entire conversation creates instability in the market, right? It, it gets to the, the fundamental foundation of what we consider to be a democracy. And within that creates massive economic risk, right? Because uncertainty creates risk. And to, to get back to your your question, you know, in, in Nevada, we had a group of individuals do a false slate of electors or one of the states that sent in a certified, uh, and I would use air quotes there, uh, certified group of electors that were absolutely not elected. The Secretary of State in Nevada, who happens to be a Republican, uh, has been an absolute champion here, uh, making sure that the rules were followed. But this false slate of electors was sent in. And I think when you talk about sort of the, the technical pieces, that ambiguity that the congressman mentioned allows for a space where bad actors can make bad choices. And so removing that ambiguity, I think, is exceptionally important. 
because functionally what we're seeing there is a symptom of that larger problem, right? A symptom of that sort of political and cultural malaise. You know, our, our governor was literally assaulted uh, a couple of days ago at a restaurant with his wife and daughter by a gentleman who screamed a number of things, including that he should be hung from a lamppost, right? We are in a different place right now. And so we need to make sure that there are no technical ways for bad actors to be successful uh, because if not for people like Secretary of State Raffsburg and others, along the way, we could be in a real jackpot right now. And and from an economic perspective, that's terrifying to us, right? Because there are certain things that we just assume uh, that we have removed the risk from a specific transaction uh, that things like this add back in. And that, that can create a lot, of, a lot of uncertainty. I think here in Nevada, we've done some really great things to expand the right to vote additional early voting locations, making sure that people who have been disenfranchised in the past aren't disenfranchised in the future, expanding mail-in voting so now that everybody has access to it because we've seen it be successful and safe in other states. Um, but it's always concerning when it could be the actions of another state and another legislature, another group of people that you don't interact with uh, that are making decisions on a national level outside of simply the fair and true results of elections. Uh, Congressman Boyle, welcome. And um, um, uh, you, you, your, con co your colleague, Congressman Himes, uh, uh, started his remarks by recalling that he was there on uh, January 6th. I'm wondering if you could uh, tell us how your own uh, vantage point on this issue has been affected by the experience of January 6th. And also, that might be an occasion to, uh, we'll start addressing some questions uh, from the audience. Uh, uh, Robert Kahn uh, has in the comments uh, section, how vital will the January 6th committee be uh, to resetting the political calculus of, uh, of American citizens. Well, thank you, and, and it's glad I'm uh, glad and honored to again be on a Horace's panel. Let me apologize for the technical difficulties we've had here with my lighting, but frankly, I don't look any better even with good lighting, so there's not much of a loss. Um, now, I was, um, like my, my congressional colleague and friend Jim, uh, there on, on January 6th. In fact, I was working on finishing my speech to defend the legally cast votes from my state, the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, a speech I would end up giving well past midnight, talking about um, and in quoting John Adams that every democracy at that point had died by suicide. Uh, I do worry about the threats to democracy, both external and internal. It's not just the U.S., uh, by the way. It's, it's other countries uh, in the West that are facing this real threat internally. Now, specific to the United States, um, while the January 6th commission is very important, looking at what happened retrospectively and who needs to be held accountable, I do hope in there there's a series of recommendations to look prospectively about what we need to do to ensure it, it never happens again. Because my biggest worry, and, and frankly, there's an effort afoot right now in, in my home state to do this, and that is attempt to replace the election, the nonpartisan or bipartisan election officials that called the balls and strikes as they saw them and accurately certified the election and replace that uh, with partisan uh, officials who instead will impose their own will as, uh, as opposed to that of the electorate. That is very dangerous. I mean, look at one of the candidates in the Arizona primary right now, a state that was as close as Pennsylvania was, she is openly bragging about that and using that as a selling point, a Republican candidate in the primary. Finally, I'll say that one um, strong prospect for bipartisan reform is the reform to the Electoral Count Act. Mm -hmm. um, that reform addressed the circumstances, the unique circumstances around the 1876 election, which, by the way, Samuel J. Tilden was robbed in, in that election. Um, but the circumstances 150 years later are different. It is just far too low a bar to say that you only need one representative and one senator, and then suddenly you're plunged into a major challenge of the election. We need to raise that uh, as well as do some other reforms to the Electoral Count Act. Yeah, th thanks so much. Uh, and let's get some uh, more... Uh... Uh, questions going. And, and I will say, if somebody just send a comment, because uh, there's a, at times with the harasses technology, I think there, we haven't always uh, had a good connection. But if people would let me know that uh, indeed uh, uh, you're uh, okay, here somebody's coming in. Uh, so that's giving me the reassurance uh, I need. I'm going to respond. Uh, uh, there's uh, 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 Mr. Kotek uh, wants the uh, 
wants the mic, and I'm going to see if I can give it to him. Here we go. What a rich discussion, um, and what a uh, hot one. Um, um, to have us in the U.S., the shining light of freedom for the world, to turn into a banana republic. Uh, this is, I come from Uganda, which is where Idi Amin used to run the country. Um, we are, how can this country countenance the kind of attack on freedom to vote? I just don't understand. What is it about the body politic that has gone so berserk? That's a great question. I'm wondering if I could just add on to that, uh, because one thing I do as a reporter uh, is always try to understand uh, the perspective of, of somebody who maybe sees things differently than I do or differently than the majority does. And that really takes an effort uh, in this uh, context, because I really, really have trouble understanding uh, the um, uh, the, the view of people who say the, the election was tainted or illegitimate or, or stolen. Um, but all three of you come from places where you surely encounter voters who do believe that. They're not all uh, um, uh, deceitful people or, or they're not all people who are caught up in a, in a partisan frenzy. There must be some who, who come to that uh, uh, more sincerely. What do you say to them? And uh, uh, and, and, you know, as you're answering the gentleman's question, I, I'd be curious if you'd also answer mine. What, what are the arguments that you hear and, and what is your response? Take it away, anyone. Uh, maybe, maybe I'll jump in quickly. Um, so, um, you know, when I think back on January 6th and I've thought a lot about it, that, this question since then, um, there's something I can't get over about it. Um, you know, Brennan and I saw... Um, these people up close and personal that day. And yes, there were some very dangerous people. I mean, there were a small minority of people there who were sort of militia, three percenters, those, those guys. The vast majority of the people who created this moment that will sort of be this infamous moment for a very long time were folks that you would meet in a Charleston, West Virginia Starbucks or a church. And the reason I highlight that is because not everybody there doing a terrible, terrible thing was a terrible, terrible person. And they thought, they really thought, a lot of them, that they were there to save their democracy. And so that points you in the direction of, of two things that I think we need to talk about as a society. Number one is the nature of leadership. When the president of the United States, who, like it or not, has the very biggest megaphone in our society, outright lies and says, you won't have a country anymore. This, is, this was standard Trumpian rhetoric. You won't rhetoric. You won't have a country anymore. The election has been stolen. Fight like hell or you won't have a country anymore. Verbatim what the president of the United States said. That's powerful. And Americans need to think about the damage and the violence that can come from that. The, the second thing I'd highlight, and, and here's an area where it gets a little fraught um, and where we probably have to really think about it, is, is of course, the ability of social media to amplify that. Um, I'm really suspicious of arguments that, uh, you know, everything is different now because they, I, I think, uh, are, you know, everything is not different. But something is different about social media in terms of the intensity with which we are um, presented with information that is really designed not to get us thinking about issues, but designed to access the most emotional elements of our of our minds to, 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 to infuriate us. And, and Brendan and I now live and, and the treasurer live in a political world where people aren't really interested in analyzing their information. They're interested in this sugar high of emotion and anger and rage. And the other side is no longer the other side. The other side are traitors. And it's, I, I think social media has a lot to do with the, with that evolution. No, yeah, I, I, well, please oh, go, sorry, ahead. go ahead. Zach. Congressman, please. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I was going to address uh, social media, um, but I, I would make it a little more broad than that. Um, and that is, and look, I don't, I'm not one who goes for kind of knee jerk bashing the media any more or less than I go for knee jerk bashing politicians. So that that's not what I'm about to say. What I'm going to say is something more structural. Uh, we live in a very different media environment than the one in which I was born and raised. If you think about it, I grew up in the 1980s. There was not much difference between the media environment I grew up in in the 1980s and the one my parents' generation did grow up in right after the Second World War. There were three big networks. 
ABC, NBC, CBS. Fox, not only did Fox News not exist, Fox didn't exist. Yep. You mostly got your um, information from the, the three big networks, Walker Cronkite, Peter Jennings, Dan, uh, or Dan Rather, Tom Brokaw, um, or the, the two to three daily newspapers that were in my metro area growing up, mm-hmm. or the radio, and that was pretty much it. Nowadays, the media environment in which my daughter is, is growing up is dramatically different between internet, social media, um, et cetera. And so nowadays um, people are able to consume only news that validates their preconceived notions. Right. And that is extremely different from any other previous era. So, I, and on this point, I got to say, I don't know what exactly the, the answer is uh, moving forward, because I do think for a, large 330 million plus country um ethnically diverse religiously pluralistic frankly um the old media environment served us far better than this new one zach go ahead on that yeah i i I agree uh broadly i think the what we've found is that there are this this new environment the sort of churning people up uh on what makes them um, feel good or feel bad or feel angry or feel joy about something it isn't just about politics. It's become about, and I, I suppose vaccines and masks and various other things uh, related to the pandemic have became sort of immediately political, right? And yeah. what we found is that, at least in Nevada, there are really three groups of individuals. They're the people who are going to agree with the government and agree that, you know, more voting and voting is safe and yada, 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 and you don't need to convince them. You've got people who are absolutely not going to agree with you. And in the middle, there's some group of folks uh, who are being influenced by both sides uh, who you can have a conversation with. You know, when you knock on their door and you say, hey, I'm running for office and doing this and they've got a problem with X, Y, Z. And you can talk through it and they still want data and they still want uh, information and, and opportunity and they just want to build a better lives for themselves. Those are the folks that we focus on. Uh, because I do believe that there is just a subset of the population on both sides that have moved from making the best decision for themselves into one of faith, right? Where it's, it's just a, a zealotry, um, uh, again, on both sides, that makes it difficult to change somebody's mind. And we don't really spend any time trying to do it anymore. Uh, I do think to the Congressman's, Congressman Hunt's first point, the, the importance of having leaders who do not take what is very clearly the easy and effective road, right? Demonizing the other side, uh, looking for scapegoats, finding more of those leaders and supporting them whenever you can, regardless of their party, uh, is exceptionally important. I think the, the Republicans who have stood out and said, hey, these things that the president, uh, that President Trump is saying are dangerous to the republic, I think we need to get behind them and make sure that they know that, you know, America thanks them for their efforts. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I, I see on the picture, uh, Ms. Reingold, and, and is your mic working, uh, ma'am? And if uh, so, let uh, me give it a no, try. No, it's working. We hear you. Sure. Okay. Uh, Please uh, ask away, or if you've got a comment, uh, uh, share. Yeah, uh, well, a couple of comments. Uh, I have been thinking a lot about the media, obviously, and how they cover everything. Um, and the the you have a segment of the media that is covering things like they've always covered things, and it's a new environment, and they don't seem to have catched up, or they, they, they're not caught up with how things are really happening in the world and they keep uh they're on this how do i put it this route that they ask the same kind of questions or they behave in the same way and they react in the same way instead of challenging uh particularly challenging the lies uh that's one comment and the other comment i have is that uh fox news as a uh, quote news uh is is broadcast on every it, it, they they're in bed with the cable company so it's broadcast on every military base it's broadcast everywhere whereas the other forms of media are not and um uh what i under i'm trying to understand why that is and how that is allowed to happen uh, I know that we no longer have the, uh, I believe it's the fairness doctrine. I mean, we, we have a lot of issues with the way media is run in this country. And I'm wondering if 
anyone has given thought to how that could be changed, for example, of this whole Fox thing where they control. I mean, you talk about uh, Tucker Carlson, for example, being the most watched uh, uh, nighttime person on Fox News. Well, it's 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 beaming in onto every TV with the basic cable package and the others are not. Yeah. And I'm wondering if people think about those kind of things. Can I, is that true that the, you that. say that the others are not? Uh, 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 sharpen that for me. Aren't the, the uh, well, for example, if you go and uh, buy a cable package, the yeah. basic cable package will come with Fox News, but the basic cable package will not come with MSNBC or CNN. You have to choose it uh -huh. as part of the package, as I understand it. Now, well, let me take that a couple of places. First up, if I may, and others could jump in on the comment about challenging, uh, and I, I, certainly I'm in no way defensive uh, of uh, media criticism. And to the contrary, I, I, uh, I benefit from it. But one thing I've noticed has been that uh, uh, the, the, the kind of established uh, uh, so-called mainstream media news organizations that Congressman Boyle referred to actually are, are are kind of more aggressive, more willing to go beyond the conventions and uh, uh, call some the, 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 the traditional conventions where we're, we're very careful about coming to analytical judgments, much more willing to say, well, that's just false or that's a lie. And at the same time, for people who, uh, uh, who uh, um, uh, are not open to it, it really lands with very little impact. Um, uh, the, the, the question of accountability is one that really uh, 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 animates me, not with just with respect to election security, but across the board. Uh, but the, routinely uh, in the Trump years, I would see things that uh, 20 years ago when I was covering the Clinton White House would have been months, weeks long or months long stories. Uh, and they pass uh, w w without much notice. Uh, it seems all of us have trouble remembering what we were up in arms about uh, 48 hours ago in this frenzied media culture. Uh, and, and so it seems to me that is one of the challenges of uh, accountability, not necessarily the, 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 the toughness of uh, journalists and being willing to call things out or, or call them as they see them uh, is, is just my vantage point. But I'd be curious what our panelists think. And also the, the, the question you raise uh, about uh, um, trying to delegitimize uh, Fox News, uh, take it off uh, uh, government uh, uh, cable systems or, or, or servers or trying to put pressure on, uh, uh, on advertisers or cable distributors. Uh, I have my own view of whether that's a good idea, but I'd be curious what uh, what you think. Well, uh, I'll jump in. Well, yeah, let's get I mean, uh, sure, go ahead, and then let's hear from the uh, our panelists. Oh, okay. What do you think, Congressman Hodge? Should, should we uh, be trying to uh, should Democrats be trying to get tougher on Fox News? Well, you know, I tell you, I get uncomfortable when I hear that. Um, you know, uh, the government cannot be in the business of deciding what media outlet is OK and which is not and and what's truth and what's not. And, you know, I mean, the First Amendment uh, prohibits us legally as a as a, uh, you know, as a matter of, of, of sitting in that position. We shouldn't do it. Uh, I mean, it sort of makes me in some sad to say that because, you know, there is just such rampant uh, so, so much rampant uh, inaccuracy out there to be polite about it. Um, but we just don't want governments being the arbiters of truth. That, 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 that concept is how totalitarianism survives in places like China and, and, and Iran. So to me, the answer, and it's a pretty unsatisfying answer, but to me, the answer has got to be more about how we as citizens regard our responsibility as citizens. Um, we should recognize what happened in the last four years. And again, we're sounding a little bit of a partisan tone because sadly, the facts would suggest that, you know, Donald Trump hadn't been a president for more than a day when his statement that he had the biggest inauguration crowd ever, which was immediately and objectively false, was the story of his administration. And that started a process because he was then going to go on and say such outrageous inaccuracies, or we can say lies if we want to, it became essential to that presidency to damage the people who report those things. So we, we got the concept of the fake news and the fake media, and, you know, and look, 
there's plenty of bias in MSNBC and Fox and oh, you see, CNN. There's plenty of bias. You can never rid the system of bias. But you do have a lot of journalists, including sometimes Fox News as a news entity, not necessarily as a Tucker Carlson entity, you know, trying to abide by the traditional standards of at least, you know, not saying stuff that's outright wrong. There's a whole other category, of course, of Newsmax and OAN that, that are propaganda mechanisms. They're just designed to, to do what Donald Trump wanted to have happen, which was to, to sort of muddy the very notion that there was truth. Right. And that's, of course, again, how totalitarians succeed. So so that the, to me, the action has to be inside each of us as citizens. You know, being citizens of a democracy is not a free and easy thing. It requires some work. It requires us having a little bit of humility and, and asking ourselves if what we're doing, Brendan said it exactly right. As I watch television, am I being presented with information that I can use to be a citizen to make a good decision about whether we should go to work, war in Ukraine? Or am I being uh, entertained? Is my, are my inner prejudice way manipulated? We somehow... There we yeah. Go. So so anyway, I don't want to go on at, at, at too much more length than this, but but I really do think we've got an obligation as citizens to um, uh, to learn to be better, uh, to be better uh, analyzers of information. Um, yeah, I, Congressman Boyle, what do you think of that? If, if, yeah, I, uh, actually, if Jim, uh, 49.9 uh, percent of the uh, of the country doesn't believe a, a critical story. They write if it's against their own side. Uh, uh, what are the levers of accountability? Yeah, so so my buddy Jim actually set me up uh, the perfect segue to to what I wanted to address, and and that is if you take a step back, and I, this is a, a topic I thought a lot about, and I I think all of us have well before this session, and I have come to the conclusion that there have been two big changes. One I already addressed with the massive structural change in the media, which was enabled by technological advances. The second, though, is the culture. Uh, has changed as well. And now this is a little bit of a chicken and egg situation. But when I say the culture has changed, one of the reasons why Jerry Ford and George Herbert Walker Bush and politicians of a previous era didn't go the Trump path is, is first the, the character that they had. But second, there was really no market for that. Um, today, there is a market for spreading conspiracy type thinking as well as hate. Um, you know, you can actually see this evolution in a character named Kirk Carlson. And I use the word character purposely. He plays a character on TV. He is, as, as far as I know, he's the only person in cable TV news history to have had his own show on CNN, MSNBC, and Fox News. And he's played a different character. In, in He's kind of done the full Ginsburg of uh, the cable TV uh, news networks. Um, he's played a different character in each one. He was more a, a straight man from a conservative perspective, um, almost a, a mini George F. Will bow tie wearing type on CNN 20 years ago. Then on MSNBC, he tried a much more centrist thing that people have forgotten. And now he's the, you know, uh, Father Coughlin uh, of, uh, of this century on Fox News. Um, why? Because... There's ratings there. Um, there's a market for it. And so how we get back to a culture that wouldn't reward that sort, uh, you know, of spewing that sort of hate and kookiness with conspiracies. We change the culture. You'll suddenly find people following their incentives and coming up with a, a different character. Yeah. Uh, 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 Treasurer Kona, and, um, on that point about incentives, we're hearing from uh, Ms. Kahn again, who had the first question, who does say, what about reducing the concentration of media power by a firm like the Mur Mida Murdoch Media Empire? Um, um, uh, you know, as Congressman Foyle has, I think, very accurately described, we've got people responding to the uh, incentives for basically commercialized contempt. It's good for business. Uh, is, is there a way to uh, make it less good for business or to reduce the power of, of, uh, of uh, certain media, uh, media conglomerates? All of those seem to be, to me, to be the, the first step on a very slippery slope, um, getting back to that control over what people are going to talk about or how they're going to do it. I, I think there is a role in the government to step in when things are factually incorrect. Um, but the, the the line between factually incorrect, right, and I don't like what this speech is, is just so thin and so dangerous. Um, and I, I frankly worry about 
the government's ability to do very precise things uh, at the scale that we do government, right? And I mean, we've seen this in first response. We've seen this in economic relief. We've seen this in like government's not great at really tactical specific actions, uh, at least in my history. Um, and and so trying to do that on the media front gets gets just real dangerous. I mean, I think there there's an opportunity or a role for government to play in helping citizens become more educated, starting at a young age, right? And the same sort of uh, same sort of critical thinking that we try to support uh, because it leads to entrepreneurialism and because it leads to, to folks being more effective citizens and, and stewards of the world. Starting that early, starting the ability to look at someone and say, well, what are their sources? What are their motivations? Why are they saying the thing they said? And, and can this be backed up? I mean, I think we have, if we had more critical thinking in some of the generations who are being most moved and impacted by the Fox Newses and the OANs and the Newsmaxes to just be able to look at those things critically, I think we'd be in a better place. Uh, and it might be generational, right? We might have just kind of lost a generation or two to this nonsense, but our focus has got to be on the next couple. You know, I, the the comment earlier about uh, making reference to uh, President Ford and uh, uh, George H. W. Bush, uh, I do think raises the generational question in that there was that generation had seen uh, the, the World War II generation had seen very clearly the clash of values between. A, a, a traditional liberal democracy and um, in, in those cases, the two totalitarian models uh, of, of fascism and communism. And, and maybe a, a, an upcoming generation needs the, 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 the sort of clarifying nature of uh, um, uh, the contest that we're in. You know, I, I think the, the, the battle over Ukraine um, um, illustrates it rather vividly. You've got the one model to the East in the, uh, you know, headquartered in Moscow that doesn't uh, uh, believe in, in uh, free media, democracy, individual liberties, uh, has a kind of a backward looking uh, uh, view of the world. And then you've got a, a, in another direction in China, you've got a much more futuristic orient society, but also doesn't believe in, in traditional values. And here we are in the, in the West kind of muddling along, it seems to me. Uh, and we can't even have confidence in our own elections. Um, 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 uh, it just seems to me that maybe we, we people need to, to have a greater appreciation of the stakes involved. I don't know. There's a question in there somewhere, Congressman Heim. What do you make of that? You know, um, reality has a way of intruding um, into systems that uh, that don't that that don't put a premium on truth, right? Um, I don't know if I'm coming through. I'm getting a little bit of a strange noise here. On, but, yeah, um, we, hear you. we hear you just fine. Okay, so let me let me hold up Ukraine Russia as another example, right? One of the wilder charges that was accepted by the American right and by a lot of Republicans in the last four years was that um, Ukraine was actually a deeply corrupt place that was hiding all kinds of information on the Biden family. You know, there's not a shred of evidence that any of this is true. But if, if you if three weeks ago you'd ask. Uh, an, an activist Republican, they would have said, you know, they, they probably would have had a Trump-like attitude towards Russia, admired the strength. You know, there was this whole um, effort mounted in the Trump administration to paint Ukraine as this this evil, corrupt place that was on the side of the Democrats, QAnon. I mean, it just it sort of spun into crazy land. And, and, and the reason I use that to illustrate the example is because then Russia does something that none of us imagined a year ago would happen, which was an 1890s style land invasion against the, you know, just brutal, violent assault on Ukraine, which even if you're still hung up in the, you know, Tucker Carlson world of, you know, somebody there tried to protect the Biden administration, you know, you, you just reality has a way of intruding. And so now, um, you know, ask any Republican, there may be two or three exceptions in the United States House of Representatives, and they'll be back to reality. They will tell you that Russia is an appalling, dictatorial, violent regime, and Ukraine is showing remarkable. So anyway, my point is that we, we should take some hope in the fact that in the long run, um, reality tends to uh, select against um, uh systems that rely on, on, on lies, on lies. And that's, that's true. Uh, you know, that's true of, of the Soviet union. It's true of any, of any entity that is, that is, that is sort of founded on the notion that they can get away from truth. Yeah. 
So, uh, Mr. Kopech wants the mic again. I, I'd note that we're running uh, just if got a couple more minutes, so it would be a good time to, uh, as we're sort of summarizing, rack, wrap up thoughts. And uh, let's let's hear from him. Let's see if that worked. He should be on. Much uh, for a he second. You got the mic. There you go. Yeah, Paul, can you hear me all right? Yes, we can. Thank, Thank you. You. Uh, you know, there was a memo written by Gingrich some time back that's been in the press uh, in some editorials that that uh, enshrined the principle of being vituperating, of, of really attacking the, the other side by character, attacking the character of the other side. This culture of not addressing policy differences with policy dialogue and rational analysis, but by vituperation and character assassination has become part of the culture. And it's become so embedded that I don't know how even reality such as we have in Ukraine uh, uh, trait. Yeah, you, you you skipped for a little bit, but that's really a good question. I, I, it is a good reminder that uh, these trends uh, that we're discussing, they, they didn't uh, begin uh, uh, in 2015 or 2016. Uh, uh, that Gingrich memo you referenced, I think, was from the either the late 80s or the early 90s. Um, it, there have been political attacks on people's character in the United States since the founding of the United States, right? The, the difference now is that they can be spread and believed and understood more quickly. Uh, and that, to some extent, is dangerous. But the, you know, if the underlying question of will America survive its next presidential election, if we're to go back to that for a second, yes, yeah. but... It's going to take a lot of work and it's going to take a lot of people making sure that we continue to go back to this true north of democracy. And, I, I, you know, we going back to the, the last question, you know, you're talking about folks who were supportive of Russia's efforts and, and sort of against uh, the arming and protection of Ukraine. And of course, now, given what they've seen, they, they've changed their tune. There were plenty of people in the United States who supported Hitler's rise to power and the work that he was doing in Germany. Uh, before we got on the other side of that thing. And so, yes, I mean, the, the hope is that you don't need that sort of inflection point um, that only comes from from death and violence uh, to get there. Um, that's the hope. But I, I think it, it requires all of us. It requires leaders or people who want to be leaders or people who have influence on leaders uh, or have that access to make sure that they continuously ask for and then reward people who are doing the work in the way that they want, right? Those are the folks you've got to vote for, regardless of party. Uh, those are the folks you've got to support and, and, and avoid. And I think I'm sure Congressman has to do with this too. There's always that moment in a campaign where, you know, are you going to take the side that you know is going to gin up your base and get them all excited? Or are you going to take the side that is factually correct? And I think some of this just takes a bunch of people looking in the mirror uh, and making the right call. Congressman, I'm going to give you the last word, but I've got a, a technical question and a broader question. The technical one we didn't really address, and maybe you would just in the, the closing minutes here, because um, most of our concern about elections has been sort of domestically oriented, the, 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 the lack of confidence in our own procedures. But what about attack from abroad, uh, uh, somebody uh, uh, using technology to... Uh, to sort of penetrate our systems. Uh, is that a vulnerability or has that been addressed in the last couple of election cycles? That's the tech, the specific question. The broader question is uh, finished by giving us something to be optimistic about. I've heard we need more responsible leaders who will summon the, uh, the better angels of uh, people's characters. Okay. I'm waiting for that. Or, or we need more discipline by citizens themselves to not believe every uh, uh, kind of inflammatory piece of BS that's out there. Uh, uh, sounds great, but uh, you know that's a that's a tall order. Just asking people to be uh, uh, more responsible in their behavior. What, what's going to get us out of that fix is is my butter problem. Um, um, we, we're, we've got just a minute or two, so go, uh, um, yeah, go yeah. Very very briefly. So the technical attack on our election. Good news, bad news. Good news is very very hard to do. Um, you know, uh, our elections are administered and run by wildly fragmented, um, you know, municipalities, different systems, it would really be hard to get in and actually mess with the results of the elections. And there's no evidence that there's been much success at that, right? And we've looked at this really, really closely after 2016. You know, the, 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 the bad, that is sort of the good news associated with the fact that, you know, the Arizona example I gave you earlier, you know, Arizona could just decide that they want to do a different slate of electors, as, as, as um, my colleague was talking about earlier. Um, so, 
So no, I think the notion of a of, a, of an actual technical attack to to uh, to change votes is very low. Now, what is what is I think more serious and more possible because we are an open society is that we could continue to see and will continue to see the kinds of uh, media manipulations that. Uh, that the Russians are particularly practiced in. You know, they call them active measures. They just, we saw it particularly in 2016, where they try to get bogus movements, uh, you know, Christians against Hillary Clinton, because, you know, they, we are subject in an open society to a lot of that sort of media manipulation. And I, at the end of the day, look, we're going to do all we can to keep the Russians and others outside from influencing our information environment. But, uh, but, but we need to do better. We need to do better. We need to remember that, look, the, the, the act of governing this country is actually a pretty dull act. You know, our, our politics in the United States, I see the treasurer nodding, right? Because he knows what he does day to day, right? He invests money and he runs pensions. And what I do day to day, right, where we have arguments over whether the you know, military budget should be plus or minus 5%. That's where the arguments are. You know, our arguments over health care, which are so, um, yeah. Yeah. you know, Nope, I, uh, we got you um, just a little bit of a. Oh, oh, OK, we, we just need to. Here's here's my point. Citizens need to remember that even if they're in a situation of real economic pain, the act of governing this country is not about rage and revolution and black and white. And it's so simple. It's not simple. It's boring and, 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 and incremental is the way our system is set up to be. The point of optimism is this. Um, you got to understand history. And if you understand history, you know that we're making slow but steady progress, right? There's an argument to be made that we really weren't a democracy until the Voting Rights Act of 1965. It's an entire demographic of American life. African-Americans were excluded from participation in what we then called a democracy. You know, we're, we're, we're making real progress. Read, by the way, the political battles of the 1850s and 1860s. You know, Brendan made reference to some contested uh, presidential elections. Don't lose heart because this is scary stuff, but we've seen it over a period of 250 years. And you know what? I believe that in general, we're doing a little better with the passage of time. We may take backward steps the way I feel like we have in the last five years, but we do make progress over time. Hey, uh, thank you both. And uh, uh, thank you, everybody, for joining. This was really a, 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 a useful panel. And uh, those are wise words to end on. Uh, thank you so much. I, I hope our paths uh, cross again soon. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you.